Since the release of the original Fallout in 1997, the series has seen its fair share of ups and downs. The most significant peak coming from the Bethesda acquisition in 2004, where they would get the rights to make three Fallout games. By 2007, Bethesda had acquired the Fallout franchise entirely, and by the next year, they would release Fallout 3, thrusting Fallout into a spotlight that it hadn't seen in a decade. Though it was far more intense now, Bethesda would adapt the Fallout setting into an FPS with RPG elements. This formula would speak volumes to many fans of not only Fallout, but Bethesda's flagship series, The Elder Scrolls. Fans of Bethesda's previous games could jump into Fallout feeling a bit prepared as the game was using the Gamebryo engine, which is also used in The Elder Scrolls. Though fans of Fallout may have been divided when it came to their opinions of Bethesda and how well they would treat the franchise, it was nice to see the Fallout series be resurrected by capable developers at a bigger studio. I first learned of Fallout 3 while at a GameStop at Northgate Mall in Seattle. While looking through the various magazines and such at the counter, I saw a Game Informer with a Power Armor helmet on the cover, with big white letters across the bottom, Fallout 3. I was so stoked that as an adult, I yelled like a small child, even teared up. The woman who was working asked me something, I don't really remember what it was, but the reply to her was just Fallout 3. She giggled and rolled her eyes a bit. It will be Oblivion with guns, she said. I didn't know what that meant, never heard of Oblivion, never heard of Bethesda. All I could see is Fallout 3. I would count each day until the release, and when I finally got my hands on Fallout 3, I could not have been happier. A first person Fallout, finally. The characters, the setting, the familiar enemies and factions, it was all there. As a fan of the memories of Fallout, this new game from Bethesda was checking all of my boxes. That is what kind of leads us into the topic of this video. Before we get started, I want to state that this isn't a Let's Bash Fallout 3 and Bethesda type of video. I enjoy Fallout 3, even if at this point I can see that some things could have been handled a bit better. I think it is a fun and solid game, and it offers a great experience. And even though it may not reflect the previous games in the best way, Bethesda has every right to tweak and change things and make the games their own. Did Bethesda do that though? With a closer inspection of Fallout 3, it would seem more like a fan game than a true sequel to Fallout 2. A fan game that is deep with lore and exciting characters, but a fan game nonetheless. And this isn't a bad thing, not always. You would want fans of a game series to be the ones to revive it. While Fallout 3 struggles with the primary setting of Fallout, one thing is for sure. Fallout 3 is the best Fallout fan game. Who's laughing now? Yes, I was in the chess club. Yes, I was in the chess club. Yes, I was in the chess club. First, let's talk about what makes a game a fan game. Most importantly, a fan game is a video game that is made by fans. This may sound like a no-brainer, but this is crucial to the process. Most games are made by developers that hold a 9-to-5 job, like everyone else. They clock in, do their work, and clock out. Some may have a passion for what they do, some may not, just like every profession. Though you could say people who are working on things like The Elder Scrolls are fans of it because they work on it all the time. Put yourself in that position though. You spend 40 plus hours a week working on a project for five years. You may be proud of your work, but to say you are a fan might be disingenuous. Granted, I am sure there are people working on these games that love them and are giant fans of the games, but a fan game goes a bit further. Fan games as a whole attempt to remake or even clone the setting and atmosphere of the games that they're based on. This is where Fallout 3 starts to enter the picture. It begins to fall into this category when you start to look at what led to the creation of Fallout 3 and those behind it. This doesn't make Bethesda's first entry into the Fallout series a lousy game, and it doesn't disqualify it from being a real game. Nothing of the sort. It does, however, take what the first two games brought to the table and spread it out into places and areas that don't make a whole lot of sense. It's almost like fans of Fallout, who lived in Maryland, wanted to make a Fallout game that took place where they lived. When you take a step back and look at Fallout 3 from this perspective, you can see its qualities as a fan game in spades. Bethesda, or more precisely Todd Howard, has gone on record saying that he went after the Fallout IP because of how big of a fan he was. Fallout and Fallout 2 were some of his favorite games after his college years. No surprise there. Fallout was considered one of the best RPGs of its time, so it's not hard to believe that somebody like Todd, an aspiring game creator, would find enjoyment in these titles. After obtaining the license for the Fallout IP, Bethesda would get to work on their vision of Fallout 3 a fan's perception of what the game might be like. Using some of the things mentioned earlier, we can use an example to prove this point further. Though some of the original creators of the Elder Scrolls series have moved on from the company, Bethesda created that franchise, continuing off their own lore and driving the story. If a company like Obsidian was to buy the Elder Scrolls franchise from a hypothetically dying Bethesda, 
building a game based off the series but set in an entirely new location, with much of the same resources being revisited, you can start to see a more precise and unbiased version of this process. Of course, that is hypothetical, and Fallout 3 is real. A real and rare example of a major company getting a crack at making a fan game. Bethesda took an interesting route when developing Fallout 3. They had choices that I do not envy in the slightest. One decision Bethesda made was to place Fallout 3 on the East Coast, in the Washington DC area. So far, nothing is wrong with this choice. I'm sure many people are curious about the events of the Fallout series and how they impacted that area. This is another sign that Fallout 3 is a fan game, though. Again, being a fan game is not a negative thing. It can become one, though, if you import most of your ideas from previous titles, especially when these previous titles would have a hard time being related to yours. Fallout 3 feels like a fan game because of how disconnected it is with the previous games, and it remains this divided regardless of the attempts to bring over enemies and even plots from the other Fallout games. Most of the reason this happens is because of the sheer distance between locations in the first classic Fallout games and Fallout 3. In Fallout and Fallout 2, we would see rad scorpions, death claws, and FEV powered super mutants that were either being created by the master or left over from his army. These things make sense to see in the first games. The first Fallout included things like rad scorpions and these death claws because those were things the developers thought you would be able to find in these desert areas around Oregon, California, and Nevada. Deathclaws being mutated from FEV, with their pre-war form being that of a Jackson's Chameleon. These types of things don't seem so egregious when they reappear in Fallout 2, as the game takes place in roughly the same area. When we get to Fallout 3, and see the same creatures, things start to seem suspect. Why are these things here? And better yet, are all of these creatures just all over the US at this point? If we see no real difference, can we assume that things like super mutants, deathclaws, and rad scorpions are the norm for life after the Great War? There's nothing wrong with that, Bethesda does their best to cover it with lore explanations. This does show that the creative minds were such big fans of their nostalgia trip that is the classic Fallout games, they needed these things in the game. This doesn't stop at the enemies encountered in Bethesda's new world for Fallout. Many other things get carried over, almost like they were picking and choosing which themes to include in Fallout 3. Bottle caps as a currency made sense in the original Fallout. The bottle caps were backed by water merchants, with each cap representing bottles of water. Thus, people of the Ravage Wasteland would collect caps and trade them for other things they may need. These caps held value because at most, any time, they could be exchanged for the most precious of all commodities, water. This was phased out by Fallout 2, where actual gold coins were given a dollar value. The NCR had started to grip the area and everyone adopted the most prominent currency, the NCR dollar. To see bottle caps show back up in Fallout 3 is a fun nod for fans, and it's certainly a great callback, but it goes widely unexplained. This currency doesn't seem to be backed up by anyone in the Capital Wasteland. For some reason, the population looked at soda bottle caps and was like, you know what? That's money. I'll give you things for those. This continues in Fallout 4, but we're not talking about that right now. The setting of Fallout 3 itself shows signs of being a fan's interpretation of what Fallout is. And there's an excellent video by Seamus Young called Bethesda Never Understood Fallout. In this video, Seamus does a terrific job of explaining this and other things that I'm talking about here. The main bit I want to focus on is retrofuturism. That's what the world of Fallout is. It's not the 1950s, it's the year 2077 as the people of the 1950s would have imagined it. But wait, it's actually more complicated than that. It's actually the world of 2077 as the people of 1997 imagined the people of 1950 would have imagined it. Actually, it's even more subtle. It's that world, but then that world was nuked into rubble and spent 84 years trying to claw its way back towards civilization. This is something that Bethesda has doubled down on and doesn't seem to be willing to take a look at moving forward. Bethesda makes it appear that the bombs dropped in a society that's flash frozen in the 1950s. Clothes, cars, television, all of these things paint a picture of this 50s Americana that Fallout simply didn't indulge. In the classic Fallout games, the old world is an afterthought. Being so far removed from any part of the pre-war, people in the wastes, they speculate, but seem to move forward in trying to make things work in this new world. Like Seamus explained, what the classic Fallout games were going for was seeing what life would be like if the vision that 1950s America had of the year 2077 was nuked to oblivion. What would life be like a couple hundred years after that? Fallout 3 instead goes with nuked 1950s, which is fine, but it's far from the original vision of Fallout. Perhaps they did this to push that aesthetic to the forefront? A fan thinking back to playing Fallout might simplify the setting by saying it's like if the 1950s got nuked, but Bethesda took that literally. Speaking of the nukes, the vibe of the classic Fallout games would lead you to believe that the people living in these times actually have a great fear of the atom. Most get uneasy talking about such things, and the whole world blowing up really drove that point home. 
While in Fallout 3, we see something like the Children of Adam, which actually makes sense, I'll be getting back to them later, but weapons like the Fat Man, a portable nuclear bomb launcher which is clearly designed as fanfare for the apocalypse. Such a device would not be found in classic Fallout games, as people were widely infected with nuclear fear. The factions we met in Fallout 3 are given the same treatment, fitting in the most iconic ones Bethesda could find. I'm personally surprised we don't see the NCR stretching their reach to the Capital Wasteland. Instead, we are met with an equally believable scenario. The Brotherhood of Steel now have a chapter on the East Coast, so do the Enclave. The Brotherhood hid from the Enclave in the past, and bottom fed off what they could from this more advanced faction. In Fallout 3, we see a pretty evenly matched fight, even after the Enclave was utterly destroyed in the events of Fallout 2. I know that the majority of you watching may be thinking that the Enclave represents the shadow government of the US, and it's much like vault -Tec. It makes complete sense that they would be out this far, especially with Washington DC being the focal point. My point is that Bethesda could have come up with something better, and they prove it with many aspects of the game. Remember the Children of Adam? Which by the time of Fallout 4 become a significant faction, at least in Far Harbor, they could have quickly become a force to be reckoned with in the Capital Wasteland along with other active original camps like the Talon Company Mercs, the Slavers at Paradise Falls, and even the smaller developments like the Republic of Dave. These things Bethesda thought up for Fallout 3 were excellent, which makes it so disappointing that the game is more filled with remnants of the past instead of the new original stories that could have added to the lore of Fallout in more significant ways. Tim Kaine, one of the original creators of Fallout, has been on record saying this was the most disappointing part of Fallout 3 to him. He was curious about what types of things we would see on the east coast of this world, but instead, we got recycled material in a sense. Same enemies, same factions, based on what Fallout used to be. This doesn't make Fallout 3 a bad game. In fact, it's one of my favorite games of all time. But it does make it murky when it comes to its roots in the series. Going through and rehashing the majority of the content you loved is fine. They even created some terrific original things to find in the Capital Wasteland. These things do make Fallout 3 stand out as a shining example of what a AAA gaming company can do with a franchise that they are fans of. This is why fans of the classic games tend to prefer the vibe of New Vegas over Fallout 3, the setting. Though staying within Bethesda's new realm more reflects that of the classic Fallout games. It makes sense to see these characters here this is where they are from. As a fan of Fallout, I was thrilled to play Fallout 3, and I was very grateful to Bethesda for reviving the series. After all this time, I can see the game for what it was, a love letter to the series. A group of guys in Maryland wanted to see what it would be like to make a Fallout game in their neck of the woods, and the result isn't half bad. Actually, I would say Fallout 3 is the best Fallout fan game. The first thing, it's a franchise that's laying dormant for a while. Mm -hmm. um, how do you maintain continuity, and what elements do you think make Fallout Fallout? So the continuity really, you know, we look at Fallout 1, obviously, as, okay, this is the, the bar for the tone of the world, what you do and don't do. And we made our list of rules as far as, here is the timeline for when things happened, here are do's and don'ts. Um, and so, I mean, everything we do, we kind of check against that in terms of, does this make sense? Thank you for checking out my video about Fallout 3, and if you enjoyed it and want to help out the channel in marvelous ways, you can leave a like on this video and think about subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content like this. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members. Your support makes all of this possible, and I'm super grateful. Special shout out to my biggest supporters, Kim Jong-un, Popo Hum, Your Typical Redneck, Fire Flare, Primark Mustard, James Starkey, and Corbin King. You guys are the cheese's pajamas. Thank you all again. I will catch you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky. You gon' trust the sky, baby girl. Testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky.